This morning we renewed our commitment as a party to not only pressure politicians in D.C. and Trenton through electoral campaigns where we can ourselves assume those positions of power, but also through leveraging our pressure from the outside against those elected officials. So today, we're going to hear from some experts in pressure campaigns and how to get things that we want done. We've invited a couple of the organizations that we're allied with, that we share similar values to, and that we have similar goals to, to come up and tell us how they approach activism. Uh, we have, I'm going to go from left to right. On my immediate right is Lauren Petrie, representing Food and Water Watch. She graduated from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry with a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies, focusing on policy and law. She spent two years in central New York working on campaigns related to hydrofracking, sewage infrastructure, and Great Lakes protection with the Citizen Campaign for the Environment. After a year of volunteering with Food and Water Watch, she joined the team full-time as an organizer for the Central Jersey and Coastal Monmouth regions, where she works to build support for campaigns to label GMO foods and ban fracking and fracking waste in New Jersey. In recent months, Lauren has worked with community members and local organizations to achieve municipal fracking bans in New Brunswick, Middlesex County, and Franklin Township. And she is now working to ban frank fracking at the local level in Princeton and Somerset County. Let's hear for Lauren Petrie. <clears throat> Hold on, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it in a second. All right, and to her immediate right is Evan Neeson, who's representing Normal, New Jersey. Evan Neeson is the executive director at Normal and is the youngest ever executive director of Normal, New Jersey, the New Jersey affiliate of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, as well as the New Jersey field director for Compassion and Choices, which is an advocacy organization that works to expand choices at the end of life. In New York, he is the co-founder and director of the New York Cannabis Alliance, which has helped craft New York medical marijuana legalization bills. In 2010, he had moved to California to run the college outreach effort for Prop 19 in California, which spanned over 40 schools and had a budget of $100,000. He was president of the Ithaca Students for Sensible Drug Policy for four years, which was rated the number one college drug law reform chapter in the country in 2011. Evan was instrumental in the passage of the New York 911 Good Samaritan Law and served as the policy advisor to Mayor Savante Merrick of Ithaca, New York, which was one of the youngest mayors in the country, where he helped spearhead an effort to pass a U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution supporting the legalization of marijuana. Evan has appeared in numerous news resources, including television, media, and print, and he also received the 2011 Normal Student Activism Award and the High Times Freedom Fighter Award for his advocacy. Let's hear it for Evan. <clears throat> Lynn's going to sit down, so I'm going to go to Anna first so that you can actually look at Lynn while I introduce her. Uh, Anna Benia Martinez is representing Wind of the Spirit today. She's a youth leader and board member at Wind of the Spirit, which is a resource center and immigration rights advocacy group organizing the immigrant community throughout New Jersey since the year 2000. Anna graduated with her associate's degree in chemistry with highest honors and is now in, under the application process to finish her bachelor's degree. Anna was brought to the United States when she was nine years old. She was instrumental in the fight for in-state tuition for undocumented youth in New Jersey in 2013 and participated in the President's Day civil disobedience in DC with the Not One More campaign, which calls for an immediate stop to deportations and deferred action for the 11 million immigrant, undocumented immigrants until a comprehensive immigration reform is signed into law. Anna is a fierce advocate for the rights of immigrant youth, her community, and human rights more broadly. Let's hear it for Anna Martinez. Now we're going to go to Anna's left, and we're going to introduce Lynn. Uh, Lynn Petrovic is a CPA who just finished her 12th tax season, preparing returns at a low-income clinic in Asbury Park. According to Lynn, it is through this practice, as well as preparing returns for private clients, that she learned that we are all connected. She is a member of the New Jersey Society of Certified Public Accountants and the American Institute of CPAs, as well as an advocate for truly universal health care, and thus a co-founder of Medicare for All New Jersey, which advocates for improved and expanded Medicare for All. She is the author of Sticker Shock, a report on the abusive practices of nonprofit hospitals who aggressively pursue the poor, un- and underinsured for hospital bills puffed up by as much as 1,000% while doling out enormous compensation packages to a select few at the top, and connected consultants in the tens of millions of dollars. She is here today representing a nonprofit entity that she recently started named CPAs for Community Support, 
whose mission is to empower citizens in their own neighborhoods to fight injustices by teaching them the financial tools to do so. Let's hear it for Lynn. And last but not least, on the far right, but not on the far right of the political spectrum, is Nina Macimpalik of Anakbayan, New Jersey. Nina Mariella Macim... Matt Kapinlik, sorry, <laughs> I'm really butchering that and I apologize, is the vice chairperson for Anak Bayan, New Jersey. It's a statewide youth and student Filipino community organization. She is a senior at Rutgers, New Brunswick, set to graduate in May with a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology and political science. She has worked extensively on immigration issues, doing research on immigrant students in higher education at the Institute for Health, Healthcare Policy, and Aging Research, and working as an organizer for the New Jersey Tuition Equality for Dreamers Coalition that pushed for the New Jersey Dream Act last year. On top of continuing her work with Anak Bayan, she looks forward to working as an immigrant rights community organizer at the American Friends Service Committee after graduation. Let's hear it for Nina. All right, so I asked this great panelist of activists to come, think of a couple of questions before they came. The primary question that I wanted them to address before here today is what their organization works on specifically, and more importantly for us, how they strategically orient themselves to get the goals that they want to pursue. So if we can, you can either pass the mic down the table or you can um, come, up to the, come up to the stand, but we're gonna give each organization five minutes to explain those two questions. I don't care who starts. <laughs> We're going to go right to left now. All right, Nina. Um, okay. Hi, um, my name is Nina Mackerpinlock. I'm the vice chairperson for Anakbaya, New Jersey, a statewide Filipino youth and student organization here in New Jersey. Um, our mission is to educate, organize, and mobilize our communities to address issues affecting Filipinos in both the U.S. and in the Philippines. Um, to educate, we hold community forums, film screenings, and workshops. To organize, we bring together Filipinos in the community to address these issues. We're actually working on a community survey right now, trying to address issues facing Filipinos um, here in New Jersey. Um, and we have also actively made coalitions with other organizations to fight for our communities, um, including Wind of the Spirit. <laughs> Um, to mobilize, and um, the Green Party of New Jersey, of course. Um, to mobilize, we show Filipino youth and allies real concrete measures that they can take to fight um, for their communities here in the U.S. and for genuine democracy back in the Philippines. Um, here are some of our accomplishments. Uh, last year, the Florida, Florida 15 trafficked Filipino workers were granted their T visas, which allowed them to work, adjust the immigration status, and even petition their families. Um, Anak Bayan, New Jersey played a role in drumming up their case in the media and raising awareness in the community about the realities of labor trafficking. Uh, we've also fought for and won the establishment of the first in-state immigrant affairs commission in Jersey City um, and raised awareness about the Filipino immigrant experience and built support for genuine immigration reform throughout Jersey City and across New Jersey. Um, we have helped in gathering support for the Bayanihan Relief and rehabilitation efforts in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan and have successfully convened the first meeting of Task Force Haiyan, New Jersey, which have included council members um, from Jersey City. And uh, um, accordingly, um, Jersey City has passed a city resolution in support of temporary protected status for Filipinos. Um, and last but not least, Anak Bayan, New Jersey has helped lead the campaign and win the historic passing of the Tuition Equality Act in New Jersey, um, which was passed in December of last year and is also known as the New Jersey Dream Act. Um, we are currently in the midst of planning a summer trip to the Philippines for Filipino youth leaders and interested folks um, through the Kapi Bisig um, Kabataan Network, which is an intercollegiate network of colleges across the country. Um, we're trying to get youth uh, student leaders um, to go back and help rehabilitate uh, affected areas in the in Visayas and Mindanao, um, which were affected areas, um, which were affected by Typhoon Haiyan. Um, on top of that, we are working to sustain conversations on the typhoon, environmental justice, and the political underpinnings of these so-called natural disasters especially now that the story is out of the mainstream media circuit. 
Um, Anak Bayan is the youth arm of a transnational network of um, national democratic Filipino organizations. So there's also going to be um, a delegation on mining that's going to happen this summer in the Philippines. Um, so I invite um, the Green Party to get involved in um, some of these issues because climate change is integral to what we're trying to ra raise awareness on Typhoon Haiyan and all these man-made and political um, underpinnings of the disaster. So thank you very much for inviting me and Anna Fayan's very glad to be here. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ana Bonilla Martinez. I'm a member and youth organizer with Wind of the Spirit. Wind of the Spirit was founded in the year 2000 around pushing for immigration reform and um, immigrant rights at large. Um, during that time, they've, uh, the organization started out pretty small. They actually started in a faith community in Morris County. It started with, uh, with members that were both documented and undocumented, and we've kept that membership still. Um, the, the majority of our members are, it's a mix of just like people here in the U.S. are mixed status. So I myself am undocumented, and I actually be, I became involved with this very in the year 2011 when I met um, the, one of the co-founders of this organization. Some of the victories that one of the spirit has won, um, because they are predominantly in the northern uh, Jersey, Morris County, which is a conservative, conservative county, uh, they face um, some few uh, ordinances that were aimed to criminalize undocumented folks. One of them was, and I guess one of their first battles was in 2011 when an ordinance was being, being pushed that would criminalize the laborers that would stay, stand outside looking for their work. It would give them a fine of up to $500 and maybe up to three months in jail. So one of the spirit launched a campaign against that and they were, they were successful. Another huge victory that happened in that area was in 2000. 2007 when 287G and um, which was n then in their trial era, era which is the law that, that would criminalize again undocumented folks and people that would aid undocumented immigrants around the area and so again when it's very launched a campaign to, to against this 287G that would deputize uh, officers to act as ICE agents. And in 2010, after actually after 9-11, the County College of Moores uh, implemented a policy that barred undocumented youth from entering the, the community college. So when the spirit in 2010 also launched a campaign to reverse that policy and for them to be able to admit undocumented folks. Uh, when the spirit was actually successful in getting in state in county rates for undocumented folks, but because of the backlash and just because of the um, misconception about around immigration, uh, they were forced to actually um, not bar again undocumented youth, but to charge out of county rates. So that's a, just an example of some of the misconception and you know, discrimination that happens around immigration and that that area. And also, we've, we, last year we were also involved with the tuition equity campaign for DREAMers, and we, Win of the Spirit was one of the orga first organizations back in the year 2002, 2003, to actually uh, first start pushing for this bill, even though around that time it didn't even come out of committee. But we are very happy that it did. Um, since that makes college a little bit more affordable to undocumented youth here in New Jersey. So we primarily, we do a lot of work with, uh, like I mentioned, day laborers, youth, faith communities. Um, so we do grassroots organizing, which means that we, we basically ask, of the, we ask our decisions come from the bottom up and we currently are working again on pushing for the, the other half of the bill that was vetoed, conditionally vetoed by Governor Christie last year, uh, which is the state financial aid portion of the, of the DREAM Act that would provide state aid to undocumented youth here in the state of New Jersey. Um, 
And so we are looking into this new campaign starting this year, again, pushing for that bill. So it would be really helpful if what all, all of you can you know, become involved as well, because it was just really unfair the, that Governor Christie conditional veto that section of the bill, which continues educational discrimination against undocumented folks that pay taxes here in the state of New Jersey. So yeah, I think that's it. Good afternoon, um, Lynn Petrovich, and um, I want to ask a question. Everyone here has uh, seen financial statements, so I'm going to ask who here knows what are the two most important parts of any financial statement? The two most important parts that you should look at all the time are the statement of cash flows. It cuts through all the BS in the statement, to put it in layman's terms. And the second most important part of any financial statement are the notes to the financial statement because they tell you what's happening behind the numbers. And I started CPAs for Community Support and then tax season hit. And of the 200 plus tax returns that I prepared for a broad spectrum of citizens, of the 200 plus interviews that I did, 100% of the taxpayers were 100% dissatisfied with what's going on in this country, and yet they feel helpless to do anything about it. They don't know where to start. They don't know where to look. And the purpose of CPAs for community support is to try and teach you the, to look at the statements that are public documents for the most part, and to discern which numbers are the important ones that affect your lives in your community, in your neighborhood. And that's the whole purpose of it. And I have to tell you, this tax season was a real eye-opener for me. I did not expect to see 100% of the clients. We're talking about people that live paycheck to paycheck, living in their cars, to people who have a half million dollar portfolio. Well, you know what? The people who have a half million or million dollar portfolio, they are just a hospital bill or a nursing home bill away from living paycheck to paycheck or living in their car. So we are all connected. And what happens to all of us affects all of us, maybe not with the same urgency if we have a half million dollar portfolio, but it happens to us in the same way. And that's really the message that I want to get across. Thanks. Hi, I am Evan Nissen. I am the executive director of Normal New Jersey, uh, which is the New Jersey affiliate of the Na uh, National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. I'm also the field director for Compassion and Choices, which is working on the New Jersey Death of Dignity Bill. Um, but I'm talking about, I'm here talking about Normal New Jersey. Um, so we are a old volunteer organization um, for Me Down, um, which can, can be a little tough, um, especially on this issue. Uh, but we're winning, we have 58% uh, across the country, um, almost that in New Jersey. Um, but we all are also still having 22,000 arrests every single year in New Jersey. Um, so we're working on reframing um, the messaging points around legalization and, and sort of to educate the public about the benefits of taxation and regulation um, so they don't think this is just about allowing people to get high uh, and they understand you know, the criminal justice effects and um, the economic effects. Uh, and we're also working on things like industrial hemp, which was unfortunately conditionally vetoed. Our bill was conditionally vetoed. Um, actually, just, just vetoed, just pocket vetoed um, by Governor Christie. Um, so we're working on now the, the expanding the medical marijuana program, making that uh, right, and also the new legalization bill uh, that was just introduced by Senator Scatari. Hi, thank you so much for, uh, for being here today. Uh, my name is Lauren Petrie. I'm with Food and Water Watch. I'm an organizer. Um, we basically fight for stronger laws to protect our food and water. Uh, the way that we do that is through engaging and empowering the public uh, and holding our elected officials accountable. Um, so really, our model here is building really strong infrastructure um, with membership support and allied organizations um, in communities throughout the state. Um, so when we begin a campaign, right now we're working mostly on uh, fracking, uh, banning fracking and banning fracking waste dumping here in the state of New Jersey. Um, last year, uh, we worked hard to ensure the passage of a bill that would ban fracking and another bill that would ban fracking waste from being dumped in New Jersey. Um, and both bills passed with really strong bipartisan support. 
and the governor vetoed both of those bills. Um, so basically, when we're when we're working on our campaigns, we're we're thinking in terms of you know who are the people that can that are standing in the way of what we want to accomplish, who can give us what what we want. Um, and you know the next thing that we want to ask ourselves is who are who are the people that can help us accomplish this goal, whether it's members of the community um, or organizations that we can work with um, to help us build broad support um, to win our campaign. Um, we employ the use of many volunteers throughout the state that help us uh, achieve these goals. Um, and you know we think of a, a strong timeline of uh, strategy and what tactics can we employ to put pressure on the elected officials that can give us what we want. Um, that might be. Um, you know, doing a call-in day where every you know, members of the community are calling in their elected officials or write letter-writing campaigns. Um, we have a canvas that goes out and knocks on doors that will collect petition signatures. Sometimes we'll have volunteers do a tabling event or a stand-up event where they're standing out um, in front of a grocery store at a train station collecting petition signatures from the public. Um, we'll do film screenings to educate uh, members of the community and elected officials on the issue of fracking, fracking waste. Um, we'll do lobby days where folks can go and meet with their elected officials um, to show them, you know, that they can, they can have a voice in this issue. Um, and a couple of things that we worked on recently besides the statewide campaign to ban fracking and fracking waste um, is now we're working at the local level. Um, since Governor Christie did veto both of those bills, um, we know that since there's shale under New Jersey, uh, we are, would be vulnerable to fracking in the future. So in the meantime, you know, we have reintroduced legislation to ban fracking and fracking waste. Um, but at the same time, we're also going uh, into communities throughout New Jersey um, and engaging the public to go to their council members, go to their freeholder meetings, and ask their council and their freeholders to ban fracking at the municipal level. Um, so far, we've been successful doing that in Highland Park, New Brunswick, Middlesex County, and most recently, Franklin Township. Um, you know, and, and each of those campaigns were a little bit different. Um, Middlesex County, uh, we put together a coalition sign-on letter with about 27 to 30 uh, organizations throughout the county that signed on, asking the freeholders to ban fracking within the county. Um, you know, we also did call-in days where folks were calling into the freeholders and asking them to enact a ban. Uh, New Brunswick was a little bit different. Uh, the council members, you know, we had spent months approaching them and asking them to ban it at the at the municipal level, um, they told us that they would rather see it as a ballot initiative um, and asked us to go out and collect you know, 360 petition signatures or however many it was. Um, so once we went out and we did that, we presented them with over 500 signatures uh, at that next meeting. You know, They saw that there was broad community support for a local fracking ban and they did go ahead and enact that um, without it being a ballot initiative. Wow. <laughs> Very grateful for all of the community members and allied organizations that worked with us to, to accomplish that. Um, so those are just some of the ways that we're working um, here in New Jersey uh, to build support um, for these pressure campaigns. Do you have a petition with you today? I do. Thank you for asking. It is right over here on the table. Uh, there is information about fracking, frack waste, uh, and a petition that folks can sign. Uh, and you can also check off if you'd like to volunteer. Anybody, any folks out in the crowd have questions for this? Uh, go ahead, Pat. Yes, I have uh, actually a comment for the food and water box. I'm on, I get your emails. I'm a big fan. Probably one of your biggest fans. Thank you. I everything out. I pass the information on on the, you know, the most pesticides and certain, and I follow through. However, last week, I think it was, you have a book for sale, and there was a link to Amazon.com to buy that book, and they will in turn give you some type of donation. But I just wanted to tell you that I heard about Amazon.com, and then I went to uh, Google Amazon.com's practices, and if there's any other company that you look at that you can use. I would really strongly urge you because Amazon.com is anti-union. They avoid taxes and making enormous profits. They're putting a lot of private booksellers out of business. And there's Howls.com. That's one of the very best independent booksellers online. And they sell 
used books, you can, they buy them rather. They buy them, they sell used books. Their prices are comparable. They're a decent company. And they might make a, an arrangement to give you, you know, in your organization, a small uh, donation for books that are available. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll look into that. Um, I know that when our executive director um, had the book published, she worked very hard um, to make sure that it was local, local um, booksellers that you know that were go to you know the, the big book, box store books uh, you know booksellers. Um, it was really local mom and pop books bookstores that we were um, you know selling the book through. Um, but I, I'll. I'll definitely uh, pass that information I can on. Give you the copy of the ten reasons why not to buy from. Yeah, I. <laughs> I printed it out because I thought it was really important because I admire your group so much. Thank you so I much. It. I yeah. Pass the word around. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and I'll, I'll definitely but take that information. Of course, and thank you for supporting us. Yeah. Any other questions, Dave? This is to my wife. What do, uh, <laughs> what do people suffering? Bills and medical debt, and your organization, Medicare for All New Jersey, what do they have in common? And how can ordinary people understand how they can get involved? How they can get involved with Medicare for All New Jersey? Sure. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we have a Facebook page, Medicare for All New Jersey. Um, we advocate for simply improving and expanding Medicare, which is a single payer system that is uh, under constant threat to be dismantled by the powers that be. Um, so Medicare is a lifeline to, actually I was thinking today, of all the senior citizen returns I've done, of everyone that collects Social Security, I do not have a single person that has not enrolled in Medicare. Even if they have, if they are against every kind of socialized medicine or whatever you want to call it, uh, they all love Medicare, so uh, let's just uh, improve it, uh, expand it to everyone, and um, and have it, it apply to everyone. How can people get involved? That's the that's the difficult part. Uh, I guess everyone in this room knows that our 90% of our communication is owned by six corporations, and they don't want us to know that there's this great program out there that could save the state of New Jersey two billion dollars a year at least. Uh, in healthcare costs, and the state of New Jersey has a totally unfunded, unfunded post-retirement healthcare liability. That's a promise to its healthcare, to its state, county, local workers. A promise that is somewhere in the range. It, they don't give us the real number, but they give us a range. It's somewhere between 40 and 60 billion dollars, totally unfunded. If we had an improved and expanded Medicare for all that liability would go away with the stroke of a pen because we wouldn't need that funding. We would, everyone would already be covered. But these are the types of, this is the type of information that CPA for community support is insistent on getting out to everybody and also empowering you to spread the word further about uh, the wonderful benefits and the cost saving, tremendous cost savings of uh, Medicare for all. So Nick and Dave, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Ian. Ian, all right, so Nick, Dave, and Ian. Kevin, I have a question for you. What's the status of uh, legalized marijuana in the state of New Jersey right now? Um, so medical marijuana, you obviously know. Uh, we, well, we're, our general strategy right now is wait till the governor leaves. Wait till Chris is out of office. Um, we're, we're educating legislators in the meantime. Our hope is that by the time the governor um, leaves office, hopefully because of an arrest, in my, my personal opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, by, by then, hopefully, we'll be able to just sort of move it. Um, based on my conversation, the legislature is very supportive. Um, I think we have the support in both houses already. I don't think we have the will in both houses yet to prioritize this, just because they don't want to vote if it's going to get vetoed. Um, because you know, in New Jersey, the polling is still a little lower than the national average. It's still a, a majority, but but um, I wouldn't be comfortable going to a ballot initiative yet. Um, so we're we're educating uh, members of the legislature. 
Um, and we're also working uh, to broaden our coalition. We're really going after uh, non-traditional allies. So we really are looking for law enforcement, uh, for mothers with, with children, with, for judges, uh, for these sort of people to be out in the front because uh, based on our market research, uh, that shows that the, uh, the non-traditional allies is what convinces the average voter. By the way, I, did, I don't know if you know this or not, but our friend, this is Todd Whitney, you know, remember her? <laughs> you know what her husband owns? You know what he has, right? He has the right, he has the license to grow medical marijuana in New Jersey. He's the only licensed state. I can, you can Google that. Where you can up? Oh, 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 do, do you know which uh, dispensary he would be associated with? Uh, that part I'm lost. I don't know, but all I know is Todd Whitman's him, he, the former Mr. First Man, whatever you call it, yeah. as the... Um, and by the way, as a teacher, I'm against legalization. I'm for decriminalization. Okay, cool. That's it. That's my honest. I just had a question for the younger people, because I'm not a young person. Activism, I don't think, was something that was just something from the 60s. It goes all the way back to the 30s and 20s, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, hopefully, certainly. How do the young people, you two the younger ones, may I say that, how do you see yourself in 10 years from now, or how are you dealing with this whole process? That's not where we're all stated, but, um, you know, being a young activist. Do you see an ending? Do you see a window? How are, you, here it is. How are your peers doing with this, your generation? Who are you trying to reach out to? That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, I think for, for me, at least, becoming involved with uh, Wind of the Spirit, which was very, it, it was an empowering process because at that time, um, knowing my situation as an undocumented youth growing up here in the city in New Brunswick, um, it was very empowering to meet folks that um, were very active and believed in human rights in general. So for me, at least, that's made me reconsider my... Um, no, no, excuse me. I'm, 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 let, me, let me focus on more. How, I mean, your, your peers who are home with the buds, PlayStation, mine, Minecraft, you know the rest. Your generation, how's it going with them, laterally? That's my... Oh, so it's not personally, it's like... No, so we how do you see your generation doing with activism and things? Do you see a bright future for them? Do you think they're, they're just so sad because of all the problems? Or I don't know. Personally, I know a lot of uh, youth that are involved with, with the immigrant rights movement, and I think that even here in the city of New Brunswick, there's a lot of... Um, there, I know a lot of young activists here in this city and in uh, Rutgers and even folks that are already graduated from the city. So I, I don't think that the sense of activism has ended with our, with our generation. I think that it is pretty, um, you know, the, st the status is pretty grave, I, I guess, it, because there are many issues that, you know, we can become involved in. But I think ultimately we're, we're all uh, fighting for human rights in general. So that, that could be for climate change, immigration, legalization, or decriminalization of drugs, so. Um, I think there's a misperception that millennials are apathetic. Um, rather, I think millennials or our generation are alienated. Um, also, uh, I think they're, in terms of consciousness or their capacity to organize and be activists, I think there should be a consideration given to the capacity of young people to organize and get involved. Of course, um, empowerment and seeing that you know it's possible to come together and bring about change is very important. But there are other factors, like very material realities that young people are facing today, like heavy, uh, you know, college tuition debts or or student loans, and the the reality of having to work and pay back loans immediately after college. Uh, those are things that young people are facing today and also the increasing, um, the, the increasing um, neoliberal education reform agenda that uh, is leading to the corporatization of classrooms is, um, you know, of course, encroaching on um, promoting and expanding liberal um, arts education and social sciences and humanities. So the university and education in general is increasingly becoming um, a careerist institution, or, or people are treating it as instrumental to making money and being successful rather than a place to actually um, cultivate consciousness or um, 
cultivate an inclination towards activism and civic participation. So these are these other um, material factors that have to be considered. And I think to, um, to consider millennials apathetic is sort of misguided. Um, and I think there are measures that can be taken to promote activism among young people. Um, but I don't think it is very fair to blame young people for their um, apathy or... I'm not uh, blaming, I'm just saying, but that sounds that's pretty great. I love your answer. Does the, the, the future look right for you? How does the future look? Um, like Anna said, there are still um, many young activists um, who are, you know, taking on this work. So I, I, I don't know how to, I'm not like, a, you know, I can't predict the future, but I think that there definitely is a future for activism among young people. Um, but we have to promote and consider these very real obstacles, right, to involvement. And then I'm, I'm going to make an executive decision here, and I'm going to actually include Evan in this, given that he's all 24 years old. <laughs> I, I actually have an answer, so. All right. um, and I'll keep it short. And that's a good question, so thank you for asking it. In my, I mean, I wasn't alive in the 60s or 70s and 24, but from what I could tell, I think young participation is sort of going from activism, where it's like hitting the streets and protesting, to uh, civic engagement, at least in the drug policy realm, which is where I've worked with, with folks. Um, I'm a member of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, we're a national grassroots network of students reforming the drug laws. Um, and whereas I know, you know, marijuana legalization, drug law reform in the 60s and 70s largely took the form of protests, uh, now we're, you're seeing people like me putting on suits and going into the Capitol, um, running for office, you know, meeting with their local elected officials. So I think you're seeing um, young participation change form. Um, and in my opinion, I think that is more effective, you know, meeting with electeds, dressing up in suits, uh, at least for the issues that I work on. I, I, I recognized Ian earlier, and I'm oh, going to do that. I, I just it's, wanted to address oh, just two seconds. Uh, and also, the I'm not a young person, but I'm going to give you my two oh. cents. Um, I grew up in the 60s, and I remember when Martin Luther King was assassinated and Bobby Kennedy and all that. Um, but then we had the draft, and it engaged people who were 24 years old and young people. It, it, it affected every family, the draft. And now they took the draft away. That was a strategic design. Also, with the student loan debt, the government could simply pay that money to the institutions instead of loaning it to the kids. And that would solve that problem right there. It's all strategic. It's all planned. It's all to give these kids suffocating student loan debt and force them to make a choice. Do I go out and act, get active, or do I just be quiet and pay my bills? Okay. I recognize. I recognized Ian, and then I made a decision that I was going to reserve the last uh, 15 or so minutes for myself because I, I got one more question I want to ask them. Go ahead. Uh, I think, sorry, I'll go since I have like three questions. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'll mine. Oh. oh, thank you. Um, oh, oh, careful, watch that, Michael. There we go. Um, uh, one question is, um. Today, specifically, I live in New North Jersey, Bergen County. Um, does, anyone, does anyone know anything that's going on in that area? Um, more specifically than, you know, because it's kind of difficult, but like generally, just whenever I want anything I'm interested in doing, I just go to the city, and it's not always the easiest thing to do. It's expensive, it's really expensive to go to the city. So, like, you know, I have difficulty getting to anything local. Does anyone know anything that's going on in that area? That's all three. That's all three, and then we'll pass it. Oh, uh, second, what is the People's Organization for Progress? It's up there, but there's no one from there. Yeah, they were supposed to be here. They, uh, their, their member was sick. Uh, that's well. I'll, I'll I'm trying to see where they're 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 based out of Newark. Um, is it? Oh, uh, Larry Cam. A few. Uh, there are some people here who know the name Caroline. Uh, Gay, it's, uh, and then they do some collaboration with the Essex County Green Party. Um, you know, they have like a yellow shirt, and then they they've been protesting the um, the, the closing of the uh, public schools. It's been especially that food uh, food not bombs, a, jo a job uh, not wars campaign. Um, if I may, uh, for the panel, I feel there is a question I'd like to ask also. I had one more question. Uh, what, uh, what exactly, you say national democratic, what does that mean? It's, I've heard that phrase before, but I've never really understood it. 
You want to pass the mic back? Oh, and sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not smart. <laughs> uh, uh, National Democratic uh, is the, um, I guess that's what we call the organizations that uh, Anakbayan is part of, working for um, a genuine democracy in the, Philippi the Philippines, including national sovereignty. So that's just what we call our organization. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, anybody want to answer what's going on in I know. North, particularly? Bergen, really quick, I mean, he's a Democrat, but Assemblyman Eustace is really crucial to a lot of issues that we all work on, and he won by 32 votes, and he's in Bergen County. Um, so even though he's not a Green, you know, in my opinion, that working with him or on his campaign helping him would help probably all of our issues. Um, I, I know, but I know you, you need to I was going to say really quick, I know um, as far as fracking goes, a colleague of mine, Matt Smith, is actually organizing in North Jersey uh, to ban fracking in all of Bergen County. So if all right. people want to pass the word, um, yeah, Bergen County um, is looking to ban fracking. All right. and, then, and then I've got 15 minutes that I want to ask one question of every panelist here. Um, now that we've got you here, what is the role that you would like to see the Green Party of New Jersey adopt with respect to your organizations? In other words, how can we help advance our shared goals together? Want to go? And I don't care how you pass the mic down on this one. I just want to hear from everybody. You want to start? Sure. Um, I think that the best way that um, you know Green Party could help us to advance um, our goals would be, um, you know, things that we we need from our allied organizations would be sharing information, um, be it links or events, things that are happening. Um, a lot of times we need folks to go to rallies or lobby days, um, help us petition, uh, make phone calls to elected officials, write letters, and so off. Uh, the Green Party could you know, take an active role in sharing that information and being active and engaged in, in uh, some of these activities, that would definitely be helpful. Um, you know, and if, if folks that are in, in the Green Party know other groups or other members outside of the party, um, that they could also introduce to the goals of Food and Water Watch to help us advance our mission. That would be helpful too. So really, um, just being engaged, being involved, um, and spreading the word. Um, and this is a great question. It got me thinking, not just about working with the Green Party, but working with, with anyone. Um, and the things that I thought were communication, um, so whether it's you know getting the word out to your members about a vote coming up or elected officials that need to be targeted, um, and grassroots and the grass tops networks. Because uh, a lot of times, um, we'll actually strategically decide not to get too involved in grassroots networks because that can backfire sometimes for our issue, um, but, but we still need grassroots networks. Um, and also grass tops, right? So if there's any other organizations that you would want to, that you think would work with us, you know, putting together those folks, especially, like I said, non-traditional allies, law enforcement, mothers of children, um, teachers, even though, you know, maybe we'll get you one day, um, but other teachers, <laughs> um, people like that. So that could, that could really help. Yeah, I, I can't improve upon what they said. Absolutely, networking is essential, and communication and getting the word out is absolutely the best way. I can't improve on that. Um, the same thing, sharing information, inviting folks to come out to our rallies, or educating folks on the current immigration system, and um, also uh, letting folks know that there are organizations that are pushing for immigrant rights, and if anybody knows, uh, anyone that's undocumented and interested in becoming involved a lot of times that takes a lot of um, you know um, kind of like teaching as well as moral support for an undocumented person living here in New Jersey so we you can connect us with with them we are we are providing now we are BA accredited which means that we can um, fill out immigration um, papers for them so maybe we can help with that so just connecting us with folks are that are in need and also um, educating the members um, yeah I think everyone covered most of it uh, promoting each other's events um, going to each other's um, yeah rallies um, events and campaigns and things like that um, also I think I mentioned before there will be a delegation to the Philippines on mining I don't know if you have the capacity to send a delegation to the Philippines um, but there will be that conversation um, so the Green Party can get involved in that and also um, Task Force Haiyan is still going on we might we will probably convene a meeting soon so it would be great to have a representative from the Green Party there 
um, to talk about how to keep the conversation about climate change, environmental justice, and um, typhoon relief going. I just wanted to say that the Green Party is cooperating uh, with many groups already, and one uh, is Food and Water Watch, and uh, we're selling these uh, t-shirts right up at the front desk there. We're selling these t-shirts. They're usually $20. They're only $15 today. It says, what the frack on the front, and ban fracking now on the back. And 100% so, and of that money goes to Food and Water Watch. We don't keep any of it. So that's one way you can support Food and Water Watch today. So the shirt's actually free. It's, it's when you join a membership to Food and Water Watch, you get the t-shirt for free. You're that, you really become a member. What are our shirts? You know, we have 10 minutes, so I don't mind extending it. I had seen Lauren's hand, but I had seen Alvin's first. So let me go Alvin, and then if we still have time, Lauren. Thank you. <clears throat> I know the gentleman behind me was asking you uh, guys, um, what do you see yourself doing in the future? And all I, uh, I, I would say, I would uh, make suggest that if you didn't have a sense of justice, you wouldn't be behind that, wouldn't be behind that table right now. And if I can extrapolate from my own personal experience, from the civil rights movement on to the anti-war movement on and on to the Green Party, it does get to be uh, a you develop a, a real uh, passion for justice, and uh, so I, I would I would suggest that uh, you're very likely to be uh, involved in other issues in the future because you're involved in this issue and you're not being paid today. You you're here because you believe in something. So that's that's all I had to offer. And we're going to go with Lauren. We'll see if we have time for Katie. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, I, I guess all of you could answer. I, I, I know, Lynn, you talked uh, you, about being CPA. I, I think what I'd like to know, you said you met with, I guess, about 200 clients. They feel like they're disenfranchised and nothing they could do would work. Now, the question that I want to know is to the taxpayers. So, uh, what I want to get to is, is to, if they're complaining, are they complaining about how much tax they pay, where the tax money um, is, go is going to, um, if they felt like getting involved did make a difference, what they would like to work on, what do they say they would like to do if they felt it did make a difference, and where the money could be uh, better spent. I, I'd, I would like to know if maybe some of your clients have talked about solutions that they feel uh, could help, and that they would feel differently if they, if they saw things being done differently. Most of the clients do not complain about the tax rate. Uh, they they're not. They're not concerned about. Is it on? No. <laughs> they're not concerned about the tax rate themselves. They're concerned with more immediate things like their family. So even if uh, I'm doing a return for a retired couple who has a second home in North Carolina and they're only here for the summer, or they're only here for the yeah the summer, uh, they're concerned about their kids. Their kids are getting laid off. Their grandkids have suffocating student loan debt. Their daughter hasn't been to the dentist in, you know, a year. These, that's what I'm talking about in connecting the dots. It's not, they don't get into the nuances of where our tax money goes. I don't sit there and preach to them and tell them that as much as 60 cents out of every dollar goes to the military complex. I don't do that because their pain is so personal and they can't look at anything else. They want to know why has their child been unemployed for a year? Why did they have to move back home? How are they going to handle that student loan debt? These are their urgent and immediate problems, and they do not know where to turn to look to try and solve that. And so as hospitals get shut down, as nursing homes get privatized, uh, they don't understand, so they have to, so what I want to do is to show them how they can get engaged in what's happening in their community. Um, go ahead, Nick. Do you think writing letters to the editor would, would be a good first step in, in bringing attention to these problems? I'll tell you my own personal experience. I broke my leg in 2011. 
I went to the Monmouth Medical Center emergency room, thanks to Dave. I couldn't walk, I was in a wheelchair. I broke my leg. And uh, <laughs> my leg was swollen three times its size, and I could not see a, a physician. I could not get any medical treatment until I answered no less than 35 questions, totally unrelated to my injury. I, what kind of insurance did I have? Did I have a copay? Where did I work? What's the phone number? How am I going to pay for the copay? What about the deductible? Yada, yada, yada. And about an hour later, I finally saw a physician. After I answered all the questions, I wrote a letter to the newspapers. It was published in several. The one that got the most attention was the Atlantic City Press, which did a great job of making it an op-ed. And I'll tell you, I had to go back to the Monmouth Medical Center emergency room the year later. And I'll tell you, they've changed their practices completely on what they do with emergency patients. The first thing they do is they get you in to see a physician and then they talk about the financial stuff. I, I don't know whether my letter had anything to do with it, but I got it out there. I've been a thorn in Monmouth Medical side, especially on financially. They're financial shenanigans. They're a nonprofit. Um, so I, perhaps that changed it, maybe it didn't, but I can't see how writing a letter could hurt. I think it would be one of the best things you can do. And we're gonna close with Katie. Uh, Lynn, your organization is CPA, uh, CPAs for Community Support. That's very specific, and yet you were advocating for single fair, uh, for Medicare for All, which is something I've felt passionately about for years and years. Do ordinary non-CPAs, like people like me, in your group, or do you screen for other groups? I mean, how, do you, how, how would somebody like me get involved with the, your issue? With, with the uh, single, payer. single payer, you will go right now. I've been the Medicare inf for all. The inf okay. Medicare for all has a Facebook. Medicare for all New Jersey has a Facebook page. You can go and you can join, and you can get engaged with Medicare for all New Jersey that way. Are you on Facebook? Oh, I uh, know my husband is. Okay, well, you can get engaged that way. Also, I'll CPAs for Community Support also has a Facebook. I have found Facebook to be a tremendous tool for reaching out to the community. I, it's really better than a website. It is just, it, you can share it, and it is just a very, very, very powerful social tool for getting the word out. I changed my mind. We're not going to close with Katie because Katie asked a really good question that should have went to everybody instead of just Lynn. So now we're going to go down. <laughs> How do you get involved in a knock by on, Wind of the Spirit, Normal, and Food and Water Watch? How, we how do you get involved? Like, how does how oh. somebody out here that's not already plugged into an Akbayan get start getting involved with an Akbayan as an individual? Um, okay. Uh, well, I guess you can start with Facebook. We do have a Facebook page, um, an Akbayan New Jersey, um, and we also have Twitter. And uh, I think we have Instagram now, and we also have a WordPress in which we. Um, release press releases, or we publish press releases there um, to show the things that uh, we've been working on. Um, if you like us on Facebook, I think the event invites go out to people, to various events. Um, you can also, um, I can also collect email addresses if you'd rather get emails. We, can, we send out things on a listserv. Um, so that's, that's one way. Um, also, if um, Anak is primarily a Filipino youth and student org, so we have Filipino youth and student members. So if you know anyone who might be interested in joining, um, also feel free to let me know. Thank you very much. And the same, same, same uh, website. We have a website. Um, you can Google us, Wind of the Spirit. Um, we also have a Facebook page, Twitter, and I can also take email addresses if you're interested. And again, our organization is made up of uh, mixed status, so we have people that are citizens, people that are legal permanent residents, undocumented people, people that have under the whole immigration spectrum, um, that's what our membership looks, looks like. So anybody is welcome to join with the spirit and, and become involved in the many um, areas that we work around because we do um, work with workers, um, faith communities, and youth, so. <laughs> Um, so, also for us, I would say Facebook. Uh, we also have a website, normalnj.org, but Facebook is really where we put everything out. Um, we also have regional Facebook groups, so we have one for the North, Central, South, and Jersey Shore members, so they can talk to locals. Um, letters to the editor are really great. Uh, if you want to write a, a letter to the editor or op-ed about the regulation, about the benefits of regulating the cannabis industry, that would be a huge help. Uh, and finally, just talking to friends and family. Um, 
finding those those great advocates who can then talk to their uh, networks. Uh, so if folks want to be involved uh, with Food and Water Watch, I'd say the best way to do that is uh, become a member, uh, get on our, our email list, sign a petition. Um, you know, we'll definitely be emailing you, uh, potentially you know, giving you a phone call, letting you know what is going on uh, in your community, in your state, um, as far as what campaigns we're working on and other ways that you can get involved. Um, and there's so many ways that people can get involved, um, you know, whether it's coming to a film screening, hosting a film screening, writing an LTE, writing an op-ed, um, uh, or going out and helping us collect petition, petition signatures, making a call to your legislator, helping out with a lobby day. Um, there's so many different levels of involvement for folks um, that there's something out there for everybody. Um, so the best way to do that would be to contact your local organizer. We do also have um, a state and a national Facebook page where you can find great information for what's going on um, in the area and statewide. Um, so I would just say, yeah, um, you know, sign a petition, uh, let us have, share your email information, and um, that's the best way to stay connected. All right, and on that note, let's thank all our panelists for giving their time today.